Let us begin with an opening remark by the president of KIAS, Professor Jae Kyung Choi. Yeah. Um, I would like to invite all of you to this memorable and valuable lecture. It's memorable because this lecture is arranged on the occasion of 25th anniversary of KIAS. And it's valuable because the speaker is one of the world lead, leading topologists. And I hope many of you will get some inspiration from Professor Kallegari's lecture. And I also hope that many of you will be able to visit KIAS soon. Thank you. Okay, sorry, oh, my microphone was muted. So today's speaker is Professor Danny Calgary from University of Chicago. He graduated UC Berkeley in 2000 with a thesis titled Foliations and the Geometry of Three Manifolds. His thesis later became an influential book in the discipline. He was a Benjamin Pierre Pears assistant professor at Harvard, Merkin professor at Caltech, university professor at Cambridge, and now a professor of mathematics at U Chicago. So his contributions include the complete resolutions of Martin Tamis conjecture and Althor's measure conjecture, which were recognized by the Clay Research Award in 2009 and he became a fellow of AMS in 2012. His research interests include low dimensional topology, geometry group theory, complex dynamics, and possibly many more. He is also a writer of several short stories featured in magazines such as Chicago Quarterly Review and Dunes Review. So Professor Caligari will give a series of two talks for Kias Quadrant Centennial Lectures. The title is Sausages and Butcher Paper, but I believe it's not about food processing science. So let's find it out. Welcome, Professor Caligari. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, let me say uh, how grateful I am for the uh, invitation to, to speak, how, how honored I am to, to speak here. And, and let me also thank Sam personally for uh, uh, thinking of me and, and reaching out to make this uh, possible. This is, this is uh, uh, I'm sorry I can't be physically in, in Korea. I remember previous visits having enjoyed it very, very much, but uh, uh, even so, it's sort of uh, uh, very nice to be with you virtually. Uh, tonight's my time. I guess it's not night time where you are, but uh, yeah. Okay, so I wanna talk about um, something in, in, in the subject is, is complex dynamics, but I'm not really gonna talk about dynamics. Um, I'm not actually a dynamicist. I don't really know any dynamics. Um, what I am is a topologist, um, and, and so what happens is uh, in this world, this world of complex dynamics, some very interesting objects occur, some very interesting uh, gadgets, gadgets sort of have, have naturally occur, sort of uh, the, the space of functions with a certain property, the space of dynamical systems with a certain kind of property, and uh, some extremely intricate uh, topological or geometric shapes, like if you know what the the Mandelbrot set is, and we'll see some pictures. This is sort of a, uh, an example of a very easy to describe, well, in, in some sense, uh, mathematical object, but whose, whose uh, explicit, explicit description is extremely complicated. Um, and so really, in the end, I'm actually not really gonna uh, uh, prove any theorems or, or really even almost state any theorems, but, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about certain kinds of topological spaces, and I'm gonna give, talk about two, um, two ways of seeing this space. Uh, so two extremely uh, explicit uh, topological descriptions of these spaces. Um, and and they, they have quite different flavor from each other. One is sort of uh, extremely combinatorial in nature and really uh, is related to some, some one real dimensional gadgets called laminations, which are familiar to people working in the theory of uh, Teichmuller theory automorphisms of surfaces, three manifold topology, foliations, and so on. And the other is sort of a, a description using algebraic geometry. And these are these are sort of the sausages and the butcher paper, I guess the other way around. Um, all right, so let me talk about um, what, what it is that I want to talk about. Um, so the gadgets that I want to talk about, these spaces, something called the shift locus. All right, so the shift locus is, so we're going to fix a degree, D. So D is going to be, the, uh, uh, 
a, a positive integer. And um, actually, in, in most of the examples I'm going to talk about, it's going to be a pretty small integer. It's probably going to be two, three, or maybe I might get all the way up to four. Um, and this D, this degree D, is the degree of a polynomial. So, so we're going to be talking about polynomials in one variable, in one complex variable of degree between two and four. So it doesn't sound like there's an awful lot to say, but, but it turns out, in fact, maybe there's, there's uh, more to these things than meets the eye. Um, so if we have a polynomial, degree D polynomial, F of Z, um, which is, let's say it's a sum of, of uh, B sub J, Z to the D minus J, um, after a suitable change of variables, so we can replace Z by a kind of a linear change of variables, Z goes to alpha Z plus beta, um, we can conjugate this polynomial into kind of a normal form where uh, this sort of the leading order term where it osculates uh, Z goes to Z to the D sort of to second order uh, at infinity. So F of Z is, is, we can write it in the form Z to the D plus a2 z to the d minus 2 plus a3 z to the d minus 3 plus dot 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 plus uh, a sub d, where a2, a3, a4, and so on up through ad uh, are going to be d minus 1 complex numbers. All right. Um, and what we're interested in is the dynamics of this polynomial. Well, what does that mean? Well, a polynomial is a function, but it's also a, a map from the complex plane to itself. Um, and what we're interested in is uh, the qualitative features of uh, the dynamical system, which is given by applying this polynomial f to the complex plane over and over again repeatedly. So you have a complex number, you take its value under f, you take its value of that under f, you take the value of that under f, and so on and so forth. So you iterate this polynomial, evaluate it repeatedly uh, on, on this number, and this complex sequence of complex numbers wander around. And you want to understand uh, the dynamics of this, of this, uh, these iterations. Um, all right. So the shift locus is going to be a particular set. So it's going to be a subset of the space of uh, complex degree one, de co complex polynomials of degree d in one variable. Um, and we might as well have put them into normal form because the shift locus is going to be uh, to be in the shift locus is going to be a property that depends only on the conjugacy class. And so uh, we might as well put it in normal form. So we're going to think of our, our polynomials of degree D as um, D minus one dimensional complex space with coordinates A2 up through AD. And the shift locus is going to be a subset of that. So SD here um, is going to be a subset of uh, D minus one dimensional complex space. And it's going to consist of those polynomials which have a particular dynamical property, okay? And the dynamical property they have is as follows. So we have a polynomial of degree D. So it has a bunch of critical points. So the critical points are just the roots of the derivative of the polynomial. So that's a polynomial of degree D minus one. So typically you have D minus one roots, D minus one critical points, although some you might have multiplicity. So you might have some critical point which has multiplicity bigger than one. And what we do is we apply the polynomial to the critical points. So we have a critical point C, so a root of the derivative F prime. So F prime of, the, of this critical point is equal to zero. And what do we do? We, we look at this, this, this number C, this critical point, and we evaluate the function F on it repeatedly. We have C goes to F of C, goes to F of F of C, goes to F of F of F of C, and so on. So we get a sequence of complex numbers. And what we require for this polynomial f to be in the shift locus uh, is that this sequence of numbers should converge to infinity. Okay, so as you repeat this, you repeatedly apply f, these numbers, they get bigger and bigger in absolute value eventually. Eventually, they get bigger and bigger in absolute value and head off to infinity. Well, so this is something that's sort of not so hard to check. You have a polynomial, which is z goes to z to the d plus some small change. 
when you have a number whose absolute value is big enough, depending on the size of the coefficients, you know that the future iterates of it are going to head off to infinity. Um, so uh, your critical points, you can find these critical points by just finding the roots of a polynomial, the, the derivative of f is equal to zero. Um, and for each of them, you can apply these transformation f some number of times until it gets sufficiently big that you know from that point onwards it's going to head off to infinity. So you can check this. So the condition of being in the shift locus is sort of some stable, numerically stable thing, but in particular, it's an open condition. It's an open condition on the, con on the coefficients. So the shift locus S sub D is an open subset of the space C to the D minus one. So it's a complex manifold of dimension D minus one. All right. Um, and what I wanna talk about in these talks is uh, I really just want to talk about the topology of this space. So this is a topological space. It's perfectly uh, uh, well-defined gadget, um, and and we want to understand its sort of topology for various for various d. Um, and no, so I'm going to state a theorem in a in a kind of uh, completely uh, unhelpful, almost meaningless way here. The main theorem that I want to talk about, it's really just sort of a meta theorem, is that um, the theorem is there is a very concrete description of the shift locus. That's the theorem. Well, I can fill in a few details. The theorem is that the shift locus is built from some simple explicit pieces in a simple explicit way. Um, the catch is that there are infinitely many of these pieces typically, and so altogether an aggregate, the space ends up being rather complicated, but each individual piece, and for that matter, the way in which they're kind of uh, glued together and assembled uh, is a completely explicit thing, something you can completely calculate. Um, so I know this is not supposed to be a super technical talk, but but for, for people that know uh, sort of what this what this sort of means. Um, so technically this 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 thing has sort of the structure of a kind of a complex of spaces. So you have a collection of spaces and they glue together in a certain pattern and the combinatorics of that pattern is sort of governed by the cells um, of a complex. And the complex is, is uh, a, a certain kind of technical object called a building. Um, and it's a certain kind of building. It's an A sub D minus two building. So the shift locus S sub D is an A sub D minus two building of spaces. Um, this is all sounds sort of very, very sort of fancy. So, so um, for instance, uh, an A1 building is just a graph. And, and I should say that this building is even a contractible building. So an A1 building is a tree. So when I say that SD is a uh, AD minus two building of spaces, in the case of uh, say low, low degree, so the shift locus in degree three, it's a tree of spaces. And these spaces are very explicit and you can say what they are. So trees are not, are not particularly scary and, and neither are buildings, but the terminology might be a bit off-putting. Um, so the abstract structure of this space is very simple. It's just a combinatorially quite a simple space. It's, it's contractible. And the species, pieces that it's built out of, there's two um, uh, quite different, but, but both natural uh, descriptions of what these pieces are. There's a, there's a kind of a combinatorial description. This is sort of the, the butcher paper uh, via, via these gadgets called laminations. Um, it's sort of an iterated bundle. It sort of has the structure of uh, an iterated fiber bundle where the fibers at every stage are extremely simple. They're just a disk with some finite number of points removed. Um, and there's a catch, which is you might have to quotient out by a sort of a finite group. But these, these particularly the pieces, the individual pieces that this thing is built from, extremely simple kind of spaces. They're almost as simple as just products of, of disks with finitely many points removed. Um, there's another description, a kind of an algebraic geometric description. These are the sausages in the title, which says that these pieces have a, another completely explicit description. And actually, it's a little bit mysterious that these two things end up describing uh, the, same, the same spaces in some very concrete, but not obviously equivalent ways. Uh, these are algebraic uh, varieties. They're, they're very simple varieties. They're, they're what are sort of essentially, um, they're slight generalizations of, of these things called discriminant varieties, which are very well studied and, and have many relations to low dimensional topology, braid groups, and so on and so forth. So S sub D is a complicated space, but it's built in a not so complicated way from not so complicated species. 
uh, pieces. And that's, that's really the main theorem. All right, well, just to give you an idea of exactly how explicit, uh, ex I mean by explicit, here's, here's sort of the three-dimensional case. So S sub three, so this is an open subset of C sub two, right? So these are polynomials of the form uh, Z goes to Z cubed plus PZ plus Q for complex numbers P and Q. And so it's a subset of this two-dimensional complex space. Um, so it's, a, it's an open uh, uh, complex two-dimensional manifold as a real manifold, it's four-dimensional, um, has the structure of a product. It's homeomorphic to a three manifold times R. And the three manifold is extremely explicit. The three manifold is a subset of the three sphere. In fact, what subset is it? It's S3 minus um, something which is kind of like an infinite link. So something called L infinity. Uh, what's L infinity? Well, so L infinity is a union of uh, pieces L sub N. What's L sub N? L sub N is just a link in the three sphere. So just a finite collection of circles in the three sphere. Very, very explicit. Um, L sub zero, so the starting point is just the trefoil, the right-handed trefoil. I hope I, I drew something approximating a right-handed trefoil here. So um, L sub, and once you know what L sub N minus one is, L sub N is obtained from that in the following way. You just add some new strands. For every strand in L sub N, you add a cable of it. A cable is basically just another knot, which kind of goes around, wraps around some number of times kind of longitude wise, and also maybe some number of times meridian wise. So kind of a, a torus knot sitting on a little tubular neighborhood of that. You might have more than one, it might be a torus link. So each component gives rise to a set of new components, which are sort of sitting on a little torus boundary as a kind of torus link. Um, and so the union of these sort of infinitely many, but individually very, very sort of combinatorially simple links the union of this is sort of some interesting kind of solenoid uh, sitting in S3 and the complement of that, but sorry, S3 here is the three sphere sitting in the three sphere. The complement in the three sphere is an open three manifold. The product of that three manifold with the real line is a four manifold and that's homeomorphic to the space S sub three. All right, um, I mean, I'm telling you this because I guess I'm, I'm proud of how sort of explicit this description is, but also hopefully that you won't get um, completely scared off by all this sort of nonsense about buildings and quasi-projective varieties and so on. This is a very explicit space and the description of it is, recursive description of it is, is extremely concrete. Okay, so there's a lot of very explicit combinatorics and, and geometry. All right, well, so that's S sub three, but what about S sub two? So let's even take one step even further backwards. Let's look at the case of degree two. So degree two polynomial. So this is f of z is just z squared plus c. It has no constant term because we conjugated, sorry, it has no linear term. We conjugated away the linear term uh, by a change of coordinates so that it was the only uh, 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 non uh, sort of, uh, the, the only interesting coefficient is the constant coefficient c. Um, so f z is z squared plus c. And so uh, the shift locus s sub two is a subset of the complex plane, the complex plane with parameter little c. So little c is going to be a parameter in the complex plane. It's going to parameterize these quadratic polynomials z squared plus c. And uh, these polynomials are going to be in the shift locus exactly when, well, the critical point, and there's only one critical point, um, under iteration of this polynomial heads off to infinity. Well, so this polynomial, so this polynomial z squared plus c, so the derivative of this polynomial is just 2z, and so the root of the derivative is zero. So there's one critical point, and the critical point is zero. Okay, so all of these polynomials, they've been normalized, there's a single critical point, the critical point is zero. So what do you do? You apply the polynomial f to the critical point and see what happens. So you start with zero and you apply this polynomial to it. So you get zero squared plus C. So it's just the constant C. And then you apply this polynomial to it. You get C squared plus C. And then you apply this polynomial to it. You get C squared plus C all squared plus C and so on and so forth. You get a sequence of uh, increasingly more complement, complicated uh, polynomials of degree two to the N uh, in, all, in this sort of uh, 
variable c, um, but it's a sequence of complex numbers and it depends on this input, the original number little c, and you ask, does this head off to infinity or not? Uh, if it ever gets sort of a, 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 you know sufficiently big, then it will keep off heading off towards infinity. Otherwise, uh, it, it, it doesn't. And the shift locus is the set of numbers little c for which this sequence does in fact head off to infinity. So if you're familiar with with uh, the definition of the Mandelbrot set, and this is this is uh, I first saw the Mandelbrot set I think in a Scientific American uh, article sometime in the uh, mid mid 80s, and and uh, sort of blew my socks off. I was still in high school at the time. Um, this Mandelbrot set is, is sort of defined as basically as the complement of this set. So the set of complex numbers C for which the orbit of zero under this repeated iteration stays bounded, never heads off to infinity. Well, it either never hot heads off to infinity or it heads off to infinity. And so you're either in the shift locus or you're in the Mandelbrot set. So the Mandelbrot set is the subset of the complex plane, I guess I should just call it the complex line, um, which is exactly the complement of the shift locus S sub two. And so here's a, here's a little picture of the Mandelbrot set, uh, not the most beautiful uh, picture, but uh, anyway, a reason, one, one that, that maybe at least if, you, if you've seen it before, you're probably kind of familiar with it. Um, you know, it's, it's one of these things where a lot of the structure is in, in the fine details. And if we had a, a magnifying glass and zoomed in on it, of course, We'd, we'd show lots and lots of, of complexity that everybody knows about. Um, by the way, the terminology Mandelbrot um, for, for Mandelbrot set, um, uh, maybe uh, many people know, but, but, but certainly not everyone. Uh, this set was not actually uh, either discovered or, or even first studied by, by uh, Mandelbrot, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, a few years earlier than Mandelbrot did, did sort of any work on it, uh, uh, Brooks and Matelsky uh, in in um, uh, proceedings of the sort of famous uh, uh, workshop on Riemann surfaces at Stony Brook from 1978, uh, published a discussion of uh, two generator subgroups um, in PSL2C, um, for which somehow this Mandelbrot set turned up as as sort of a, a, an interesting uh, adjacent gadget. And you can see um, I have a, a little magnified picture here uh, from. <laughs> from their, their paper. Um, and, and sure enough, this is sort of somehow the familiar Mandelbrot set that before the name. Um, well, I mean, uh, everything in, 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 in mathematics is, is named uh, not after the person that discovered it. Um, and and uh, so Brooks um, maybe had some bad luck with not having the Mandelbrot set named the, the brooks Matelsky set, but um, in another sort of field of mathematics that I've worked in, in the theory of uh, bounded cohomology, there are some things called uh, Brooks quasimorphisms that are extremely fundamental and, 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 and uh, highly discussed objects. And they, and they weren't uh, invented by Brooks. Um, they were actually introduced a few years earlier by, by Rem Tula. So uh, presumably something is named after Rem Tula that Rem Tula did not in invent and so on and so forth all the way back to Euclid. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, the point of this picture is the following. Um, if you care about the Mandelbrot set, and maybe you care about it like me just because it's very uh, beautiful aesthetically, then one way to sort of understand it is to understand its complement. And so uh, at the very least, if we can say something about the topology of its complement, well, that tells us something about the topology of the Mandelbrot set. And analogs of the Mandelbrot set in, in higher degree are objects of sort of intense study in, in complex dynamics. They're extremely complicated uh, 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 geometric and topological objects. And possibly that there's a, a um, kind of route to, to understanding them or understanding something about them by studying the topology of their, their complements, the shift locus, because that ends up being uh, in many ways much easier to analyze. Okay, are there any questions so far? I mean, I haven't really said much, but uh, let, me, let me sort of get on with it. All right, so, so to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, some dynamics. Um, so if you have a, a complex polynomial F uh, or even a, a rational map on the Riemann sphere, there are some nat natural sets associated to it dynamically. There's the so-called Julia set, J sub F, which is the closure of the set of repelling periodic orbits of F. 
So um, our polynomial f, um, it has uh, many periodic, it has some periodic points. A periodic point, of course, um, is uh, a zero of an iterative f minus z. Um, so the degree of that's very big. So it has lots and lots of repelling points and almost all of the, oh, sorry, lots and lots of periodic points and almost all of the periodic points, all but sort of finitely many, some very small number of them are repelling. So there's lots and lots of repelling uh, periodic orbits and the closure of the set of these repelling periodic orbits is called the Julia set. And the complement of the Julia set, this omega sub f, uh, is called the Fatou set. And this is named after Pierre Fatou and Gaston Julia, who were French mathematicians who in the early 20th century basically, uh, basically uh, invented the field of, of holomorphic dynamics. Um, but they didn't have computers, so they couldn't draw pictures. So uh, they didn't get to name things like Mandelbrot sets. Um, and roughly speaking, the dynamics of F um, falls into sort of two, the, this partition into the Julia set and the Fatou set, roughly speaking, reflects the dynamics of F. F acts uh, chaotically in a certain sense, which I'm not going to clarify uh, on the Julia set, and it acts more or less sort of discreetly on the complement. And the Fatou set, uh, people that have worked in the closely related field of Kleinian groups can think of the Julia set as being like the limit set and the uh, Fatou set as being like the domain of discontinuity. Um, so the quotient of the, the, the Fatou set by the action of F is going to be a Riemann surface of finite type, which is, is uh, carries some interesting information about the map. Um, and so there's a characterization of polynomials in the shift locus. F is a polynomial in the shift locus, if and only if two things are true. Um, first of all, the Julia set has to be a counter set, but that's not enough. Um, the Julia set has to be a counter set. And furthermore, the dynamics of F on that counter set has to be uniformly expanding. So this counter set, the map F has to take it to itself by a kind of expanding degree D map. So if you think of your counter set as, for instance, one topological description of a counter set that's sort of very common is you take a, a D letter alphabet and you look at the space of right infinite words in a D letter alphabet that sort of topologically is a, is a counter set, you know, an infinite product of a finite set. Um, and you look at the shift on that, which shifts everything to the left and, and forgets the first, the first letter, that's a D to one map of a counter set to itself. The dynamics of F on its Julia set should be topologically conjugate to that, what's called the topological shift. And that's where the word shift locus comes from. So the action of F on its Julia set is conjugate to the shift map on right infinite sequences in a D letter alphabet. Okay, so just remark, it's possible for the Julia set to be a counter set, but for F not to be in the shift locus. But the fact that F is structurally stable, sorry, the fact that F is uniformly expanding uh, on its limit set, on, sorry, on the Julia set, implies that the dynamics near the Julia set is structurally stable. If you perturb the polynomial, if you move it around a little bit, well, the Julia set also just moves around a little bit and the dynamics of the nearby guy on the nearby Julia set is sort of conjugate to the dynamics of F on the original Julia set. And so what this means is that as you move your polynomial around in the shift locus, if we move around, we imagine the shift locus is some space and we're moving around in the shift locus. For every point in the shift locus, we get a counter set on the complex plane, namely just the Julia set. And as we move around in the shift locus, this counter set moves around and it braids around in some interesting way. Um, and therefore, uh, in the standard way, we get a beautiful representation, a monodromy representation. If you go around a loop in the shift locus from one point back to itself, then you get a one parameter family of embeddings of the counter set in the plane and they move around in some beautiful braid. And so you get a representation from the fundamental group of the shift locus into the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set. So um, people that uh, uh, think about braid groups and braid groups turn around, you know, come up in every sort of field of mathematics. That's where you take, say, finitely many points in the plane and you braid those all around and you look at all the possible ways they can get braided around. And that forms a, a group which turns out to have a lot of, of beautiful sort of ties to, to algebraic geometry and topology and so on. This is a kind of a, a 
uh, kind of uh, a dynamical version of these braid groups. This is the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set. It's perfectly good mapping class groups. I think for a long time, people were a little bit shy of the idea that it's a surface of, of infinite type. But these days, there's a very healthy community of mathematicians who are doing some really interesting work on understanding uh, these so-called big mapping class groups. And so this shift locus is a very naturally occurring space whose fundamental group has this tautological representation into this into this mapping class group. Um, so uh, with some with some collaborators, Juliet Bavard, Mary Hay, uh, Sarah Koch, and and Alden Walker, uh, we managed to show that this this uh, uh, monodromy representation is actually even uh, injective, at least in degree three. I believe it it, it should be injective in general, but I, I think that's a, that's certainly not a not a theorem. Um, and I wanted to very quickly uh, show you just a little movie of this. Um, so uh, let's see if I can share screen. How do I share screen? Uh, uh, hmm. I used to have a button that said I could share a screen and I don't- On, on your PC? On my PC, and now I don't see where uh, it is. Uh, how about now? Uh, so on the oh, right, there we go. The, little okay. green button. Little green button. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, yeah, Sam. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. So here, just for the sake of fun, is a. So these little three little blobs here. If you zoomed in on them, which maybe it's going too fast for you to do so. Um, there's like th one big blob and three little blobs, and inside each of these three little blobs, there's three even smaller blobs, and so on. And I realize it's blue on blue, but this, the limit there is sort of a cantor set. This is a cantor set, uh, Julia set of a polynomial. This is a nice family of degree of Julia sets of degree three polynomials, which are sweeping out some interesting braid. Um, unless you think these braids are all the kind of extremely boring kind, here's the slightly less boring example. Um, maybe it's still boring. Anyway, um, all right. Uh, what does the blob mean there? What's the meaning of the blob? The blob. The blob. Uh, so is... I mean, so I mean, so what mathematical meaning of the blob shown in the picture? Uh, the mathematical meaning of the blob is that it is an approximation of um, the Julia set. So there's a a nice harmonic function um, on on the complement of the Julia set, which actually we're going to come to in a second. And this is these are sort of level sets of those functions of these kind of blobs. Yeah. Um, all right. So we need to go back to sharing uh, this guy. Sorry about the AV. Fun, but anyway, all right. OK, so I now, I, so that was sort of one thing to talk about. And I, I also want to talk about um, a kind of a, a, a relationship uh, between these sort of shift locus uh, and, and uh, a more um, kind of uh, simple but important sort of uh, thing in algebraic geometry, so-called discriminant variety. So um, let's suppose our function f has distinct roots. Okay, so we have a polynomial. It's a polynomial of degree d. It has d roots counted with belt multiplicity. Two of them may be equal or they may all be distinct. Um, let's suppose it has distinct roots. Well, so uh, for f to fail to have distinct roots would be for it to have a multiple root. And if you took um, the derivative of that, um, one of those roots would persist and it would, it would follow that one of those roots was also critical. So uh, in order for f to have distinct roots is equivalent to saying that um, zero is not a critical value. It's not the image of any critical point under the image of f, okay? So suppose that is true. Supposing f has distinct roots, so all the critical points have values other than zero, we're gonna make a new polynomial, g, which is just the old polynomial f times a big number lambda. Could be a real number, could be a complex number. All I care about it is that its absolute value is really, really big, okay? Then I claim actually that this thing here is in the shift locus. Why is that? Well, my critical points, all I knew about them was that their image was not equal to zero. 
So by, by new polynomial G, it's just the old polynomial times a really big number. Well, so if I take the, the value of these critical points, these critical values, and I multiply them by this really big val value, really big number, then they get really big. And once they're sufficiently big, then we know they're gonna head off to infinity. So that says that whatever you started with, if you hit, if you just take the polynomial and just multiply it literally by a sufficiently big number, the result is gonna be in the shift locus. So if we sort of scale all the coefficients by some enormous number, so we head out way out, out towards uh, infinity in, in the sort of space C D minus one, then to be in the shift locus out near infinity is a little bit like um, being in uh, the space of polynomials with distinct roots. So what this means is that if you look at the shift locus out near infinity, it looks like, and I'm just gonna put like in quotes because this is not a very technical statement, um, the, the complement of the discriminant variety. This little triangle here refers to the space of polynomials of degree D, which do have um, multiple roots. So in order to have multiple roots is uh, for a certain polynomial in the coefficients of your polynomial, so-called discriminant polynomial, for that to be zero. And so um, the locus of polynomials, uh, which have uh, multiple roots, is itself a nice algebraic variety. Um, it's actually sort of cut out by a single equation, the so-called discriminant polynomial. Um, and that defines a kind of a hypersurface, a sing singular hypersurface in C D minus one. And the complement of that is near infinity like the shift locus S sub D. Um, they're, they're not exactly equal, but, but sort of the further out towards infinity you get, the more similar they look. So for instance, in degree two, Z squared plus C, the shift locus, um, sorry, the discriminant variety, well, we have a polynomial of degree two, Z squared plus C, the set of numbers C for which this has a multiple root is just the single number zero, right? If C is not zero, this does not have a multiple root. The roots are plus or minus the square root of C. If C is zero, it has a multiple root, namely zero. So the discriminant in degree two for these normalized polynomials is just the point zero. So that says that S sub two is like a punctured plane near infinity. Well, fair enough, that doesn't tell us much. What about degree three? We have a polynomial of degree three, Z cubed plus PZ plus Q, then the discriminant uh, is exactly the polynomial minus four P cubed minus 27 Q squared, okay? So this cubic polynomial has a multiple root exactly when minus four P cubed minus 27 Q squared is equal to zero. Um, so the exact coefficients minus four and minus, minus 27 don't really matter. What's important is it's something cubed plus something squared is equal to zero. So uh, geometrically, this looks like a kind of a cusp. It has a sort of singular point at the origin where P and Q are both equal to zero. So this is this discriminant here. And uh, as is sort of well known, if you look at the complement of, of uh, this uh, cusp curve, um, it basically looks like R times uh, the, the link complement. Uh, if you take a little sort of sphere centered at the origin, that's a little S3, it intersects this variety in a knot and actually it intersects it in a right-handed trefoil. So uh, the complement of this discriminant variety in degree three is homeomorphic to S3 minus a trefoil times the real numbers. Um, and so I said S3 looks like that discriminant uh, variety uh, near infinity. Well, so S3 minus a trefoil times R is certainly like, if you squint your eyes, uh, S3 minus this sort of solenoid, which is still pretty close to a trefoil and starts with a trefoil um, times R. So that's uh, one sense of which these uh, these things are kind of related to and, and kind of uh, geometrically and topologically similar to um, uh, uh, these discriminant varieties. So, um, and so just to bring this back to a discussion of, of mapping class groups, these discriminant varieties, C, D minus one minus the discriminant, um, this is a configuration space for D distinct points um, in the complex plane, uh, which add to zero. The adding to zero is just a normalization. You could just translate them around until they 
add to zero. So up to homotopy, it's the same thing as the configuration space of D distinct points in the complex plane, which uh, as many of you know, is a, is a beautiful example of a K pi one, a space whose universal cover is contractible, determined up to homotopy just by its fundamental group. And its fundamental group is the braid group on D strands, the ways in which these D points can kind of braid around in the plane. And so um, in fact, there's a nice map from pi one of the shift locus to the braid group of the, of the uh, shift locus S sub D to the braid group on D strands, um, which is uh, given by the braiding, not of the roots of F, but of the fixed points of F. If I have a polynomial, which is in the shift locus, well, you can, amongst other things, it has to have uh, exactly D distinct uh, fixed points. Um, and so as you move around in the shift locus, the fixed points move around. They're a subset of this Cantor set. And so they themselves do their own little braid sitting inside the Cantor set. And so you get a nice map from pi one of the shift locus to the braid group on D strands. This is a subjective map, but uh, certainly very, very far from being injective. We already sort of saw an example. All right. So the first sort of little piece of technology I want to talk about is, is uh, also kind of also about 100 years old and due to Lucian Butcher, who's Polish early 20th century. And, and because I'm a kind of a lowbrow guy, uh, I pronounce butcher a little bit like the uh, uh, English word butcher, meaning to chop with a, you know, and, and so I'm, and this is the butcher from butcher paper. Kurt McMullen, who is much more sophisticated and worldly than I, pointed out that butcher actually means uh, cooper, uh, someone who makes barrels. But uh, anyway, um, that's, uh, that's too sophisticated for me. Uh, what Butcher uh, proved is the following sort of, it's really just sort of a nice observation, but it's extremely powerful observation. It says, if you have a polynomial of degree D, then you can find a conjugacy of that polynomial to the map Z goes to Z to the D on a neighborhood of infinity. Well, topologically, that's pretty easy to see, but actually it's, it turns out you can make the conjugacy, it's a holomorphic conjugacy. Um, actually not so hard to prove, you just sort of, write your holomorphic conjugacy, it's just the germ of a conjugacy, write it as a power series and just inductively solve what the coefficients have to be in order for it to conjugate F to Z goes to Z to the D and check that this thing is a positive radius of convergence. So sort of uh, not such a hard theorem, but it's extremely powerful theorem, tells you there's a little neighborhood of infinity in which the dynamics of F is holomorphically conjugate just to the map Z goes to Z to the D. So I've sort of drawn two copies of the Riemann sphere here. The one on the left is uh, has the, the map F acting on it. Infinity is the sort of the point at the top. And then there's this little sort of scattered dust down the bottom. This is this Cantor set, the Julia set. And on the other hand, the right hand picture, I've got Z goes to Z to the D um, and Z goes to Z to the D uh, is certainly not in the shift locus. Uh, the only critical point is zero, and that just stays fixed. It does not head off to infinity. It's about as far from the shift locus as you could possibly get. In fact, the disk, the unit disk in the plane is exactly the Julia set. Everything outside that um, gets, gets uh, sorry, that's not quite true. It's the boundary of the, of the, of the unit disk is the, is the Julia set. Um, so it's a circle, it's certainly not a counter set. Um, and, uh, but you get this conjugacy between a little neighborhood of infinity uh, on, on the F side and a neighborhood of infinity on the Z goes to Z to the D side. Well, you have this holomorphic conjugacy and the key word is it's holomorphic. So we can analytically continue it. And you can always sort of just analytically continue holomorphic maps until uh, you get to a critical point. So you can extend this conjugacy backwards out along, I've drawn um, little sort of black circles, which are circles of constant um, absolute value and uh, green rays, which are rays of constant argument. And then I've sort of drawn their pre-image uh, over on the F side of things. So these green rays, these radial rays of constant argument, we just extend the conjugacy backwards along those rays as far as we can. And we can basically extend it all the way until we come to a critical point. And then if we do come to a critical point, well, what happens at a critical point? You have two rays that are being extended back from infinity, which collide into each other at a critical point, and then they kind of split apart because a little neighborhood of that, that little kind of place where these two things cross under the critic, under the under the map, under the critical map, locally it's going to map like z goes to z squared, it's going to map to a single line. So the preimage of a single line is going to go backwards to a kind of a cross going through the critical point. 
And two of those things on the cross are kind of descending. They come from infinity and two of them come out. And there's nothing we can do with those, the guys that come out. Um, and I'm drawing those in red and the other ones in green. And you basically get a singular foliation of the plane um, by, well, green rays coming from infinity. And when these green rays hit each other at a critical point or the pre-image of a critical point, then they split off a little red ray. And then that, those collection of red rays and green rays fill up everything except uh, the Julia set, which is just this Cantor set, and the collection of little red rays uh, pieced together. If you took the closure, you get a little red dendrite here, which sort of connects up this Cantor set, Julia set to itself. And the complement of that is sort of open and dense. It's the entire kind of plane. And you have this holomorphic conjugacy between the complement of that little dendrite um, and the exterior of the unit disk in um, the Z goes to Z to the Z picture minus the little red arcs that we couldn't extend these things to. So we've got little red arcs on the, on the left side and little red arcs on the right side. And the only difference between them is to get the little red arcs on the left side from the little red arcs on the right side, you take two of these arcs, you cut along them and you glue, to, glue them together. So this is a recipe for recovering the dynamics of F on its Fatou domain, omega F, from the dynamics of Z goes to Z to the D on the complement of the unit disk, except with the one proviso is that you have to take the unit disk. So this unit disk, um, there are these little red arcs. These are the sort of the places that we couldn't get this analytic continuation to, these little red arcs. Um, and uh, you have to cut along those little red arcs and then glue them in pairs. And I don't know why I'm sort of moving that around. Let's just leave well enough, well enough alone here. So the end result of this is we extend this conjugacy and do just a little bit of elementary cut and paste. We can think of the right hand thing as being made of some very concrete thing. It's made of basically the complement of the unit disk is a cylinder. So it's like a flat piece of paper. And we just cut along some vertical lines in this paper, and we just did some gluing rearrangements of this paper. So we're, we're rearranging this sort of doing this cut and paste to build a new Riemann surface. The dynamics of Z goes to Z to the D on this surface that we obtain by cut and paste becomes exactly conjugate to the dynamics of our original map F on its Fatou domain. So we built a, a model for the Fatou domain out of paper. So this is, this is what I'm calling butcher paper. Um, and so this is sort of the conclusion is that we have a model um, for the dynamics of F on its, on its, um, uh, on its uh, Fatou domain uh, made from this completely uh, explicit sort of almost combinatorial picture of just a bunch of little vertical slits taken out of the complement of the unit disk in the, in the plane, excuse me, together with the, the very explicit map Z goes to Z to the D. So it's a completely kind of, if you like canonical coordinates, on the Fatou domain. So these are sometimes called butcher uh, coordinates. Um, and so uh, let's sort of go into this in a little bit more detail. How exactly does this work? So each critical point for F, so F has degree D, so it has uh, D minus one uh, critical points counted with multiplicity. And let's just assume that they're simple for the moment. It's going to give you two arcs in E, right? So you have a single uh, point here, a single point, single critical point here, gives you a pair of arcs, gives rise to two arcs in, um, I was using this blackboard bold E to stand for exterior of the unit disk. So blackboard bold E means the complex plane minus the unit, the unit disk. It's E which has been cut open along these little red slits and re-glued to make this surface. So each um, critical point for F gives you a pair of arcs in E, those are the red arcs in this little, uh, uh, sort of sketchy picture. Um, and the arguments differ by uh, an integer multiple of two pi over D. And the reason for that is that these are sort of the endpoints of this arc, these little dots here, the endpoints of this arc, those are kind of the image, if there were an image of the critical point. Um, there is no image because the analytic extension exactly fails to extend to the critical point. So we get two values instead of one, but the critical value, the image of the critical point under F does map in a well-defined way under the butcher coordinates 
to the image of these two points in uh, E. So we have two different points, the two endpoints of these arcs. They have to have the same image under the map Z goes to Z to the D, which means that the arcs thereon have the same length and that their arguments differ by an integer multiple of two pi over D, okay? And just to record the fact that these two arcs correspond to a single critical point, I'm gonna draw a little pink uh, sort of uh, semicircle, uh, or a little pink arc in the, in the kind of the unit disc to indicate that they're supposed to be joined up together, okay? When I do the cut and paste, I cut along these two red arcs and then I glue the opposite sides of the two red arcs according to pairs of red arcs that are joined by a little pink arc in the disc. And that's how I build my Riemann surface. Um, and to keep track of the gluing, we get to put these little arcs, this little arc inside D, this is something we're gonna call this a, a leaf. And um, the fact that when you do this cut and paste, the resulting surface, well, it's a subset of the sphere, in particular, it's a planar surface. The fact that it's planar is equivalent to the statement that these little leaves, these little pink arcs do not cross. Okay, so we get a collection of leaves that do not cross, and there's a word for that, it's called a lamination. Here's an example, so a nice degree three guy, we have two critical um, points, and they correspond to the two red leaves here, those are the two critical leaves, and then all the other leaves are just pre-images of those. Okay, and these are all the places that you need to cut along the critical leaves and their pre-images, and then do cut and paste on the result in order to build a Riemann surface which is holomorphically uh, equivalent to the for two set uh, and the action of z to the z on z goes to z to the d on it is holomorphically agrees with the action of the polynomial f um, so there's a little lemma and so you might sort of say well this picture i drew it um, and maybe the reason i know it exists it's quite a complicated picture the reason I know it, it, it kind of exists at all is maybe that it came from a polynomial and, and the fact that the for two set is a, is, a, is a planar surface means that everything's a lamination and so on and so forth. And you might ask, what are the possible constraints on where these red arcs can be? And the answer is there are no constraints whatsoever. These red arcs can be anywhere at all, providing the angle between them is, well, here, two pi over three, because we're in the cubic case and providing they don't cross, they have to have the same length. And, and so this is a little lemma that says that for any choice of these two red arcs, there's a unique way to figure out how all their pre-images should be joined up in pairs to give you lamination, to, in, in, so that the resulting thing is a lamination, so that leaves don't cross. So this is a little lemma. Given the location of the critical leaves, there's a unique choice for the pre-images, so the result is a lamination. And so we can define a kind of a purely combinatorial uh, gadget, these uh, butcher shifts, space BS sub D, it's gonna be just the space of pictures like this. The space of, if you like, invariant laminations, extending a little bit into E, invariant under Z goes to Z to the D with you know, finite number of critical guys that, that uh, I sort of just gonna map to sort of a, a single sort of spec. Um, the space of these things, is some well-defined space. Um, each one of them, if you do cut and paste, it gives you a nice Riemann surface. Uh, topologically, that Riemann surface is um, a sphere minus a counter set or a punctured sphere minus a counter set if you don't put infinity in. Um, and it has a nice degree D map on it with D minus one critical points. And you can ask yourself, when do these Riemann surfaces actually come from an honest polynomial in the shift locus? And the answer, so this is a theorem of, of Laura DeMarco with Kurt McMullen from, from maybe, I think, 10, 15 years ago, is that, that the answer is always. So there's a, there's a complete isomorphism. In fact, there's complex manifolds between the shift locus and the space of these so-called butcher shifts. And the proof is, well, we already have the Riemann surface. We have the Riemann surface. We have the Fatou domain. Right, we have we have this Riemann surface, and we have the dynamics on it, and the dynamics has d minus one critical points. All we're missing is the Julia set. All we're missing is this this Cantor set. Well, we have a Cantor set. The space of ends of this Riemann surface. This Riemann surface has a kind of Cantor set of ends. When you do all this cut and pasting, you get 
things split apart more and more and more, and they limit down to a kind of canvas. So you have a topological canvas set. So all you need to do somehow is to embed this Riemann surface in the Riemann sphere in such a way that the action of z goes to z to the d extends holomorphically over the Cantor set. So there's several different proofs of this. There's one sort of nice proof actually, which is just a variation on, on Thurston's uh, skinning map, uh, uh, part, part of his, his uh, uh, proof of hyperbolization for Harkin manifolds, people that uh, know, know kind of the Kleinian group picture. There's a kind of a way where you sort of first choose some approximate um, uh, uh, extension, which maybe is not quite invariant, then you use the dynamics to replace that with a better approximation, and then you use the dynamics to replace that with an even better approximation. And this sequence of approximations, uh, basically this is a, a skinning map on a certain type model space, converges and you get a fixed point, and that, that sort of solves this extension problem for you. Um, the degree two case, well, if this is true, we can now analyze the space S2 completely, the degree two case, we have a single critical leaf and the arguments are antipodal. So a degree two uh, polynomial in the shift locus is just determined by a pair of complex numbers um, of absolute value bigger than one, um, which are one's equal to the negative of the other. Well, the space of such things is just an annulus. So BS2 is an annulus. So the shift locus S sub two is an annulus. Well, one of the ends of that annulus is the point of infinity, and the other one fills in with the Mandelbrot set. Therefore, the Mandelbrot set is connected. So that, and, and furthermore, it has the check homotopy type of a disk, which is to say, if you knew it was locally connected, you would know it was actually homotopic just to a, to a disk. So this is a famous theorem of Dewey and Hubbard from, from the 80s. And actually, uh, logically speaking, their proof is more or less this one, although they didn't really describe it in quite these terms. In a way, they were they showed that a certain parameterization, this butcher, butcher parameterization was analytic and proper and, and, uh, and so on. Um, so uh, there's, I just wanted to mention, only to say that I have nothing to say about it, there's a very famous conjecture in, in uh, holomorphic dynamics, whether the Mandelbrot set so we know it's connected. I just gave you a proof, um, but is it locally connected? Uh, no one knows, um, and I have nothing to say about it. Um, I was just about to demonstrate, um, uh, so I have a little program that, that we can play around with a little bit to get a little bit of insight into these laminations and how they work, um, but I realize it's coming up close to, um, I guess it's 11 o'clock where you guys are, so I'm gonna save that uh, and the technical details and also the sausages so stay tuned for sausages uh, next week. Um, and just in case um, you, you uh, uh, don't feel like uh, tuning in next week, I wanna leave you with a little movie. And this movie sort of reflects the following thing. So I told you that S3 um, looks like the complement of a trefoil, at least near infinity. So if you take a big, um, ball in C2, so that's a B4, its boundary is an S3, and so the intersection of uh, the complement of S3 with um, that big S3, with that big three sphere, should be something a little bit like a trefoil, um, and so this is sort of a, a, a holomorphically accurate picture, that S3, that three sphere is now being presented to you as kind of a stacked in time family of planes, and uh, we're going to see um, the, uh, the, the complement of S3 is going to trace out a little trefoil in time, or approximately trace out a little trefoil in time. So some little Mandelbrot sets are going to appear and disappear in pairs and dance out a, a little trefoil in bridge position up to sort of first approximation. So, yeah. so there you can see two blobs, and they split apart in pairs, and they look like little Mandelbrots. Mandelbrots dance around and they break around. And two of them are going to disappear. And the last one disappears. So that's like a bridge presentation of a trefoil up to first approximation. All right. Anyway, so that's, that's uh, I think that's about it for, for uh, maybe uh, today.
Um, and I, I, uh, I guess I hope I, I see, see you next week. And I will play with, uh, there's more, there's more uh, audio visual magic to come. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play with a, a fun little program. So you don't wanna miss that and you don't wanna miss the sausages anyway. Thank you very much for the intriguing talk. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Can you translate this problem into some client group theory or is just analogy or is there any technique that you can really use client group theory Um, I mean, for example, I think the, best, the best analogy is going to be that um, the spaces that we're looking at, like these Mandelbrot type sets, are going to have qualitative features in common with, you know, spaces of hyperbolic structures on fixed manifolds. So, so the geometrically, uh, you know, whatever infinite volume kind of world. So you know, these one dimensional slices are gonna be like kind of bare slices. And, and uh, uh, so understanding the kind of global topology. And I think, I think um, uh, there are theorems that, are, that show that the global topology of these spaces can be quite complicated. Uh, it's possible that there's, there's uh, 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 some, some, some kind of analogy at that level. Um, part of the problem of course, is that those parameter spaces um, don't necessarily come kind of canonically embedded in some um, ambient uh, complex uh, affine space so that when you, if you want to sort of study them by studying their complement, it's not so obvious what you mean complement in what. Um, so, so uh, but, but maybe, maybe one can argue that, that, that the spaces are qualitatively different, uh, qual qualitatively related. So a theorem about one tells you something about the other. Um, in some special cases, there might be a, a, a particular way to go back and forth, but I don't, I don't think it's any more than, than, a, than a kind of analogy. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, uh, sorry. I don't know whether you're going to talk more about this next time, but this just very vaguely, the, the, the shape of the singular point of some algebraic variety seems to be closely related to the topology of SD. So uh, are you going to more formalize this like vague intuition next time or? Um, yeah, so the sausages, so the sausages, what's the sausages? So SD is certainly not an algebraic variety. It's a nice, it's a nice complex manifold, but it's a horribly complicated, complete, absolutely transcendental, um, uh, nice, you know, complex, complex manifold, nothing algebraic about it at all. But it turns out there is a sort of description of it topologically, not holomorphic actually, but topologically as a kind of increasing union of these modular pieces, which are algebraic varieties. Um, and, and those algebraic varieties, they are Roughly speaking, they are um, generalizations of these kind of discriminant varieties. So an example would be you take this cusp curve, its complement is a nice discriminant variety. We'll take two copies of it. Take, take this, this guy and then one translated up by one, and then they intersect each other. The complement of that is an interesting uh, four-dimensional manifold. It's kind of an analog of a kind of a uh, uh, discriminant variety. It's not, it's not exactly a discriminant variety, but it's sort of related to certain kind of, of subset of the braid group. That's one of the pieces that occurs in this, in this uh, uh, picture for the degree four um, maps. So, so these things turn up actually. And, and then what's interesting is that that space that you might care about anyway, that, that algebraic variety, you can, there's a completely different description of it in terms of laminations. So that in principle, the two different descriptions, each one can say something about the other if, if those are the things you care about. Yeah. I see. So you will eventually care about the shapes of the near neighborhood of the singular points only of the algebraic variety? Or no, 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 you may want to, you want to come, you want to, you care about maybe the, the complement of the, the variety, like the entire complement. But it's just, it's just that if you have like a cusp curve, well, 
the complement is a product. So, so it's easy to understand. But if you take two copies of the cusp curve that intersect transversely in sort of one, you know, three points or something, um, I guess that's not technically transverse, but anyway, um, then the complement is, is, is much more complicated. It's not just a product, it's some interesting space, yeah. Um, I have a question. So in the example, you connect a complement of triple knot with a the complement of the um, the polynomial uh, as well. I don't remember exactly, but let me get my up, screen back if I can. Right, right, right. In the beginning, is it uh, here? Oh, I think after this. Okay. Oh, this picture? No, no, before. Uh, could you go above? Yeah. Here? Uh, not this one. Yes, I think this one. So, in the, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it possible? So, is it possible when you have a any not complement, like a, for instance, figure in that complement? Is it possible to find a uh, single polynomial such that? Um, yeah. Um, the, the answer is no. Actually, this is kind of an interesting thing. If you look at links of of singularities. Um, then they give you interesting knots and links, and you ask exactly what kinds right, right, right. of knots and links can arrive. Arise. It's quite complicated, but it's a it's a restricted family. And in general, um, you know, because the complement has to be ciphered five it because there's an action, an S one action, right? Because you'll get the values where the values are non-zero and some small non-zero value, you can multiply by kind of a, a root of unity. So you don't get arbitrary sort of three manifolds. You get you get sort of siphon fiber points. So the hyperbolic one never occur. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? So if not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>